Air Show in Mexico. Dia de la, Dia de la Morte. Pick up my old track trophy. Regional track and field finals, April 22nd, 1991. Girls long jump event, Caitlin Greenbrier. First place. A uh, hundred meter relay. Jamie Bloom, Carla Jones, Caitlin Greenbrier. Cool. Nothing in there. Nothing in there. Holy Bible. Okay. Okay, weird. I've never been in an old house, so. Oh my god, Kurt Siv. Uh, dear Graham, it is so good to hear from you again. All this new. All this new house business sounds like quite the adventure. Remember the little dorm room we shared freshman year? When we were miserable, fantasizing about our dream homes, I always said I wanted a mansion. You said you just got- you just wanted a house in the woods. Look who got both. Somebody up there likes you. I could not- I could use some of that magic. Send me some lotto numbers. I'll play them. Seriously. But I shouldn't be complaining about this good old split loved? Level we've had since Bob got transferred to Winnipeg. We just got new vinyl sliding. Jealous yet? Let me know if you ever want to trade places. So how are the girls doing? How has Katie left on her big European adventure yet? Speaking of jealous, right back soon. I miss you, Rumi Carol. Okay. Nothing there. Telephone books. And nothing there. Okay. Locked. Okay. And I don't think there's any keys, so might as well head upstairs. Controlled burns scheduled for Boone County. Blooms of smoke will rise above the northern northeastern region of Boone Country over the better part of next week as part of a forestry service run controlled burn of overgrown sections of the Flintlock National Forest. Forestry crews have been prepping the area for months. The burn operation will take place between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and possibly into Thursday, depending on speed of progress, according to the Forestry Service. In addition to moving dead and overgrown veg vegetation that can lead to wildfires in drier months, the operation will serve as a valuable training tool for the forestry and firefighting personnel involved, said senior controversialist Janice Greenbrier. Smoke will likely linger in the area through the following weekend. Hmm. Not bad. Personal calendar. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Notice of temporary. Notice of temporary personal transfer. Bruce Pendleton, head of personal. State Forestry Service. To aid in the upcoming prescribed burn operation, a ranger with expertise in the procedure. Uh, yada yada yada. Uh, basically, this is his letter basically saying, I will be capable. Uh, the character that I'm playing as, at least. I'll be capable of being supervised. Um, just to see. How well I will do here. Okay. I'm 
gonna guess that's someone's room over there. Oh, what's that? Cassette tape. Ratmobile Potty Mouth for Sam. There's no di there's nothing in there. Love thing cherry bomb. Polaroid baby. Panic bitch. No you don't. You're gonna like this one. It's weird hanging out with girls. Daniel was around ever since I was little, and other girls? I don't know. But being around Lonnie is like, instantly just right. I gave her the grand Psycho House tour, and took my revenge on Super Nintendo. And it was like, I don't know, I finally found someone I feel normal around. I drove her home and she gave me this tape, and said, you have got to listen to this. I haven't stopped playing it since. Nice. She made a friend. A sternly worded letter. To whom it may concern, I, Samantha Greenbrier, am 17 years old and am therefore an independent, fully functional human being. The fact that you should uh, still forbid me from going into the city on my own is frankly absurd. Compare with Katie, who is only three years older than me, and yet you were allowed her to go all the way across an ocean to another continent on her own. I just want to spend an evening in a normally a normal, total, totally safe city on my own, like a human being, and since you may also remember that I have my own car now, you can't really stop me. Warmest regards, your daughter, Samantha. They kept her in the house? At 17? That I can understand her yell of basically being mad at her parents for keeping her in. Uh, stop leaving the light in the house on you're as bad as your sister hey shut up daniel called daniel called again he wants his nintendo game back Bat Bratmobile. Oh, that was for the... Okay. I'm not gonna play it, though. That was for a Nintendo game. I'm gonna turn that off. Scrutinize. Yep. That's, um... Uh... That's a thing. Stare. <laughs> I'm glad that you can stare at that. That's cool. Bitch games. Su Super Spitfire. Space game of some sort. Journey of Crystal. Hmm. I never got a uh, Nintendo... At anything Nintendo, so... I was always a PC person. I was too broke to get anything else. Man, Sam had that had this in like fourth grade. Yeah, that lo that looks like something you would get in fourth grade. Wait, holy Bible! Gonna put that back. King's Labyrinth, Chapter 2, Fraying Threads. Captain Allegra, still in her flowing skirt and sturdy jerkin, descended the single shining thread into the lower ca cavern of the labyrinth. She and the first mate, on their own now, grew closer to their goal, the throne room of the dead immortal king of the island. The first mate slid down the line into the stone floor. She swept chalky bone dust from the front of her canvas trousers and looked up at Allegra. The silken thread, nigh unbearable thanks to the enchanted moss and inhabited the island, trailed behind, 
leading their way back into to the entrance. From further into the labyrinth, a moaning began to echo. The more moaning grew louder and clearer. It turned into words from some ancient language they could not understand. The king's cursed voice. The hairs on Captain Allegra's arms stood on end. She looked back at the first mate, whose eyes remained locked on the blackness of the passage for a moment too long. For noticing the captain's gaze, the first mate nodded silently ahead. Following the king's ghostly song deeper and deeper into the labyrinth, they came upon a rocky gap, spilling forth otherworldly blue light. The great basin of the dead king's throne room lay below. Skeletal in rotted robes, the king was hunched over the blue orb topping his royal scepter. Shadows of his bony fingers danced on the walls at ghouls. As he sang, wailing souls flowed in one by one through the cracks in the cave walls, pulled into the orb, causing it to grow, glow brighter and brighter. Behind the king, a long staircase helps home? I'm gonna guess sewn from rock, led down into the chamber from the passage at the top. Allegra said, we have the advantage in numbers. I will draw his attention, and then you... But the first mate interrupted, no, I'm smaller and quicker, and you know of dealing with mystic energies like these. I will circle to the other side, get the king's attention, and lead him on a merry chase. She said, she held up the silk line. All traced by this invisible thread, of course, Allegra said. It is a good plan, but perhaps we should go together. The first mate shook her head. You know this is our best chance. Don't be afraid for me. They grasped hands and exchanged three tight squeezes, their palms growing warm. The first mate tied the shining thread to the belt of her trousers, gave a quick salute and a wink, and dashed off. Allegra waited, staring vigilantly across at the top of the stairs, where the first mate was to appear. The king continued his- Wait. No! Singing stopped. The king turned and began walking up the stairs. Allegra wanted to call out, do anything to stop the first mate from running head first into danger. She tried tugging on the line to signal her. No use. The king was nearly at the top of the stairs when the first mate burst through the passageway. She skidded to a stop. Even from across the yawning basin, Allegra could see the first mate's eyes grow wide. She turned and ran. Summoning his undead power, the king left the ground, levitating, gliding behind her with distressing speed. From some dank passage much too far away, Allegra heard the first mate scream. She was already running towards the sound. The line in Allegra's hand went taut, then shuddered. It fell slack to the stone floor. As Allegra ran, she was gathering line, twisting it around her arm. She came to its end, the unbreakable thread tangled limply, its end shredded and frayed in her hand. She tossed it to the ground and ran, ran, ran. That's sad! Got your number! Are you going to the dance with anyone? Who's got a crush on you? Do you like sports? Would you introduce me to your friend? Are you busy today? So dreamy. Get your friends together. It's time to find out who has a big crush. Is it Matt from science class or Daryl from track? You never know unless you got his number. What the hell? Okay. But that sword was sad! And your combo. I don't know her combo. There's nothing there. Grab. Wait. It's Steggy. Steggy! Oh, it's supposed to go like that. It's Steggy! Stegosaurus! Groove. Exclusive. AIDS in Africa. Soul Asylum Live. Eddie Vedder. Weezer. Veruca Salt wants it now. Whoop, uh, Max Martin wants it for the murder of Straight Edge. Okay. Ah, no, 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 no! Okay. That's a cool desk, actually. 
Groove, Kurt Cobain, 1967 to 1994. Soundgarden exclusive interview, Rage Against the Machine. Misfits. Nailed it, ultraviolet. Cool. A plate. Sam, I think the creative writing track would be perfect for you. Nice black. Three students from each track will be offered a full scholarship for the first year at Reed. English creative writing. Oh, this is what she was talking about. This is from previously. Basically saying, yo, you're really good at writing. If you want, you can come here. There's a good chance you'll get a good scholarship here. Um, really good books there. Classics. 